Hello, everyone, and welcome to Rigor Through Empathy. Uh, we're very happy to have you here today. Um, I want to acknowledge that I know many of us are feeling sad this week um, for many reasons, but the OTC brings a real longing to want to be with our colleagues that we, who, those of us in the CCC system who have the the um, the the privilege to attend OTC every year. It's 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 really been kind of a surprising experience for me to feel sad, you know, about about not seeing you face to face. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, and we are going to get started today by sharing a site with you. And I'm going to put this link in the chat. I know everyone viewing right now is not able to see the chat. So if you're viewing via the live stream, please look on the screen. You'll see the URL. It's tinyurl.com slash warm demander. And for those of you who are in, let's see if I did this right, who are in the room, you should see a link in the chat if you're in Zoom. We'd like you to go to that website now. Please open that website. We have a lot of goodies there for you. So um, I know that chat is disabled on your end, but you should be able to see what I put in chat. No link in chat. Okay, so can someone from, there we go. Let's try that again. Do you see it now? I think you should see it now. Thank you for, for notifying me about that. Again, the URL is tinyurl.com slash warm demander. I'm sorry, it's not that. It's tinyurl.com slash warm dash demander. We'd like you to go to that link right now and go ahead and open it up. And while you're doing that, we are going to introduce ourselves. I am Michelle Pekansky Brock and I work at the state level for the California Virtual Campus Online Education Initiative and at one. I have the honor of providing professional development to our entire system in support of effective online teaching and learning. And I'm faculty mentor of online teaching and learning for that group. Um, I'm gonna now pass it over to my co-presenter, Aloha Sargent, to introduce herself. Hi everyone, my name is Aloha and I am a librarian at Cabrillo College which is in the Santa Cruz area. And um, I also teach uh, courses for At One, and I hope there are some uh, former students uh, at this session today. Um, and I'm also a course reviewer for the CDC OEI. Hello, everyone. I'm Fabiola Torres, instructor of Ethnic Studies, celebrating the fact that our state Senate has passed ethnic studies as a requirement for graduation. Um, I am also a uh, facilitator for At One. I facilitate the equity and culturally responsive teaching and learning and um, humanizing online education. And I'm here representing Glendale Community College. And um, I'm just excited to be here to share with you. Great. Thank you so much, Aloha and Fabi. Um, Aloha, you are going to kick us off with an introduction to our declaration page on our support site. I think Fabiola is going to do that. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I, I thought I thought I said Fabi, but I said Aloha. <laughs> so, as we know, today is Juneteenth, and we wanted to provide a declaration in the value of the work that we're doing. We have here a quote that Michelle Alexander shares, and she argues that dependency paves the way to school to prison pipeline. Dependent learners are more disciplined, reprimanded, and singled out and isolated. They are the students who do not ask for help, view grades as punishment, and fail to interact with others in fear of being judged. If left unattended, we are perpetuating the achievement gap. Therefore, it requires us to have, we have here five points that were inspired by Geneva Gay, and it's, we have to, it requires us to be thorough in our knowledge, 
about cultural values, learning, learning styles, historical legacies, contributions, and achievements of different ethnic groups, the courage to stop blaming the victim of school failure, and admit that something is seriously wrong with the existing educational system. We, the will to confront prevailing educational canons and convictions and to rethink traditional assumptions. The skills to act productively in translating knowledge and sensitivity about cultural diversity into pedagogical practices and the tenacity to relentlessly pursue comprehensive and high level performance to students who are currently are, are underachieving in school. And that's what this presentation is about. All of those facets that were declared, this is what we're trying to inspire our colleagues to implement in their practice. Great. Thank you so much, Fabi, for um, kicking us off with that very important message that will tie into everything that we talk about today. Um, I'm going to ask everyone now to do a little sharing. Um, I'm going to toggle over to the share page on our site. I'm going to also put a long link to our site in the chat. Some people, it looks like, are hitting some firewall problems um, using the tiny URL. So I just put the long link in the chat if you're here in Zoom, and you can try clicking that if you're having trouble with the short link. It'll take you to the same page. Um, we want you to click on share at the top, navigate to this page, and then click on the button that says go to the answer garden. So again, on the, on the support site, click on the share button at the top, and then click on the button that says go to the answer garden. You will see this and we want you to fill in the blank and click submit. Rigor is blank. I'm going to give you a little bit of time to do that. There are no wrong answers. If you could type your response into that box, rigor is blank and click submit. So what you see on the page here, um, these are the results of your responses. And the more a response is entered, the larger the word gets in this word cloud. Let me do another refresh. It's going to change. It's going to continue to change as we get more. But you'll see that phrase, high expectations, and the word challenge and high standards. That is awesome. Um, I'm, I think all of us are so happy to see those phrases come out. As we reflect on that, we want to keep that in mind as we um, dig into our presentation today. And you can go ahead and keep refreshing that page if you want to see how it continues to change on your end. But I'm going to get us started over on our slides. Um, I do hope that many of you have seen this slide before. It's been featured in several sessions uh, during OTC, our virtual OTC this week. And it's the most updated data from the California Community College system that shows distance education or online course completion rates by ethnicity. And what I want to point out here, I know there's a lot here. It's a very complex slide to kind of unpack and understand. Over on the left, I added a red arrow for our state average of 69%, which by the way, is only 1% lower than face-to-face -face now, which is something to celebrate. But when we unpack that data and disaggregate it, what we see is that things are not equal. There's the, we, have, we have a problem here and um, we wanna address this in a meaningful way today. I also wanna point out at the bottom, it's our African-American or black students that are 16% lower than the statewide average in online courses. So let's keep that in mind with our presentation today and everybody, when you see this slide, start asking questions about what we can do about this instead of just putting the slide up and saying we need to do something. We wanna unpack this. So as Fabi mentioned, it's a well-known fact that all students do not achieve academic success at equal levels. The differences in academic performance and degree attainment, however, are not because of our students, as she also mentioned in the declaration. These differences are the effect of systemic racism in our educational systems. 
And we want to look internally because we are becoming equity minded educators. And that is what we do. We don't place the blame on our students. We know that students with black or brown skin and those who do not speak English as a native language are treated differently by their teachers starting from the very beginning of school. As a result of these biased actions, these students are less likely to receive challenging instruction when compared to white students mm -hmm. and more likely to be assumed to be incapable of achieving difficult intellectual tasks. As a result, when they arrive at your college, when they arrive in your courses, whether those courses be in person or online, they are less likely to have developed into what's referred to as independent learners. Now, as we get started with this conversation, I, I personally want to recognize that I'm coming into it from a very privileged place. We all enter this conversation through different lenses. I acknowledge the privilege that my white racial identity affords me every single day. It's something that I'm continuing to be critical about and make a commitment to understanding and exploring because I wasn't raised to do that. Um, and I just wanna recognize that. And privilege goes deeper than that. I also acknowledge the privilege of my gender. I acknowledge the privilege of my abled body. Um, it goes much deep, deeper than that. But I think it's very important to state that. So let's unpack a little bit more about the dependent and the independent learner. Students need to be independent learners to succeed in traditional college classes. They're built on the cultural values of white individualistic culture. Individual accomplishment, the ability to figure things out on your own, those are hallmarks of higher education in the US that reflect those individualist culture values. But becoming an independent learner is a process of cognitive development. And if students aren't challenged academically, it simply doesn't happen. The chart that you see here, which is adapted from the work of Zaretta Hammond, who we highly recommend, you'll find a link uh, to her book on our uh, resource site. It's cited at the bottom of the slide. Uh, dependent learners feel unsure about how to tackle a new task. They need scaffolds in place to complete tasks. And if you look at the way that our success rates in online courses have improved over the past five, six, seven years, it's because more online courses now have scaffolding built into the design because of the efforts that we've made to improve course design through the CVC OAI rubric. But you know what, those equity gaps signal something else. They signal that we need teaching online, which is different from course design. And dependent learners will sit passively and wait, if stuck, until their teacher intervenes. Let's keep that in mind too. Being an equity-minded educator starts with believing that all of your students are fully capable of learning. If learning were the staircase, you would believe that all of them could reach the top. The next part involves recognizing the cognitive and effective differences in our classrooms, especially those of us who teach at open access institutions like community colleges who serve the most diverse group of students. You have independent and dependent learners in your course. So when you look at who's succeeding, keep that in mind. Your dependent learners are fully capable of success, but they need you to adapt your teaching to support them. And you also need to become aware of your own unconscious biases, which, which is hard and difficult work. So folks, how do we do this? This is where we're gonna turn to the concept of the warm demander. This is rooted in the educational research of Judith Kleinfeld from the 1970s, who identified behaviors of effective teachers in supporting the success of Eskimo and Native American children attending rural schools in Alaska. And that's what we're going to unpack here. Kleinfeld's warm demander pedagogy is effective in face-to-face -face and online classes. If you're already starting to recognize this, good teaching is good teaching. We just do it differently online. And what are those behaviors of a warm demander? First and foremost, it's personal warmth. College professors often operate within a culture that suggests that opening up and being a real silly person like you are in everyday life 
who makes mistakes, who isn't perfect is a bad thing. Yet if we don't make a conscientious effort to establish a positive relationship with our students at the beginning of a course, we miss a huge opportunity. And here's why. Because that relationship is the foundation of being a warm demander. It is the connective tissue that enables a teacher to actively demand and hold students to the highest standards. It allows a teacher to push back on negative stereotypes that often prevent students from pushing themselves and achieving their full intellectual capacity. And that intrusive demanding is interpreted as care by students if the relationship is in place first. At the same time, the warm demander also affirms effort and ability. Luke Wood has pointed out that affirming effort alone is not enough because many of our students, particularly our black male students who live in the shadow of suspicion and criminality and also succeed at the lowest rates in online courses in our system have, no, have often never heard the words, I believe in you from a teacher. We must affirm their intelligence. So through these behaviors, worm demanders foster rigor through empathy. Relationships are leveraged to increase academic performance, produce, producing a high level of academic work becomes a reciprocal obligation between a student and a teacher. And students push themselves beyond their perceived ability so they do not let their teacher down. Now, again, still you may be asking yourself, what does this look like online? We're getting there, folks. Becoming a warm demander involves adopting the three principles of humanized online teaching. This involves presence, real human and perfect presence to enable personal warmth. It involves developing awareness by intentionally getting to know your students as more than just names on a screen through conducting a survey at the start of your semester, asking them about their career goals, their college goals, their challenges that they expect to get in the way of their, of their learning this term. And designing icebreakers and other collaborative activities that allow them to share their personal stories so they feel validated in the course. And empathy which involves trusting your students and mindfully making the effort to see things through their eyes without judgment. There's a link on this slide to an infographic that digs a bit deeper into these principles if you'd like to learn more. So are you ready for a story, folks? Because that's what we have next for you. Uh, last August, I wrote a blog post called Rigor Through Empathy. And I shared that blog post on Twitter. You see um, a, a picture here of a, a screenshot of a, of a tweet. And Aloha Sergeant, who you're now gonna hear from, replied to that tweet. Um, at the time I thought, oh, that's, that's really great. Well, I love seeing comments from my colleagues, but it unfolded into something a little bit more. And so I'm gonna pass it over to Aloha now to tell a little bit more of the story. Thanks, Michelle. Um, hi, everyone. So my story, uh, began late last August, as you can see from the tweet here. And at that time, I was prepping my courses for the fall, as I normally do. And for me, that means, um, you know, copying my content into my Canvas shells, updating my due dates, updating my syllabus, um, making revisions to my course content. And I'm also usually reflecting on the past semester and thinking about what I can do differently as I start a new semester um, to try and make sure my students do better this time around. And the interesting thing, and Michelle kind of mentioned it in her portion, the interesting thing is that I usually tend to kind of look at those problems of student success through the lens of my course design. So I'm always, like during that prep time, I'm always asking myself, what can I change in my course? Um, to better engage my students, right? To provide a clearer path to success for them. I'm constantly like tweaking things in my class in Canvas. So I'm looking at assignment instructions, like maybe if I just make this one instruction better, um, or my discussion prompts, like maybe I could just change them and then everybody would engage more. 
or maybe my grading rubric, the criteria, I need to change the point values, or you know, maybe the readings, I need to change the readings. So those are all the things that are always going through my mind at the start of the semester. And of course, those things are super important, but um, I just wasn't, I was feeling in a rut about it because I had been doing these kinds of revisions for years and still feeling like students weren't engaging at the highest level they could, still feeling like students would disappear halfway through the semester and I, and I didn't know what happened to them, um, and just generally not feeling super connected to my students. So Michelle's post that you see here that I responded to and wrote that was exactly what I needed was because it was like a wake up call for me to think maybe the answer isn't in my course design. It's not in Canvas. Maybe the answer is in my own teaching. Like maybe I shouldn't ask, what can I change about my course? But maybe what can I change about myself? So um, you can go to the next slide, Michelle. Um, the, the piece itself, if you're wondering what this, this blog post was actually about, um, in large part, it was about um, cultivating your presence online. So um, for those of you who are already teaching online, we know it can be difficult to create relationships and rapport and empathy with our students. But Michelle's post was all about how it's very possible. And if you cultivate your presence, and not a polished academic presence, but more, you know, uh, informal, for example, using a smartphone to record a video with you and all of your ums, I say so and and a lot. Um, yeah, when you do that, when students enter your class and they're greeted by an actual human being who's friendly and supportive, they feel safe. Um, you can go to the next slide, Michelle. So, after reading that, I was very inspired and I made a decision. Um, <laughs> I decided to not change anything about my course design that semester for fall. I stopped revising stuff in my course and I decided to focus totally on presence and connection um, and building rapport with my students from the beginning. So um, I did that, that was the end of August. And I decided to make one video a week. And you're kind of seeing a sampling of the videos here. And I made them with my smartphone, mostly. Um, mostly outside, like around campus or around my own neighborhood. Um, they're very short videos, as you can see the timestamps on here. And as Michelle said in her post, very imperfect, informal videos. Um, normally, I'm like sharing my thought, my essential thought about the work that they're doing that week in class. Um, you can go to the next slide, Michelle. And I have on the next slide a couple of really you know, brief clips from a couple of my videos if you wanted to see an example. Hi everybody, it's Aloha and I'm at the beach today and I remembered that I needed to make you a video introducing the module for this week, which is all about web searching. Um, and I know that most of you already know how to use Google and I know that most of you are probably pretty good at it already, but I did want to let you know to pay particular attention to the tips in the module on uh, confirmation bias and how to avoid confirmation bias when you're doing a Google search. Hi everybody, it's Aloha and I am outside of the Cabrillo Library looking at the beautiful view and I wanted to give you a quick intro to your module for this week which is all about fact checking and you're going to be learning how to think like a professional fact checker when it comes to checking your sources to make sure they're reliable for your research. Um, and I wanted to let you know that this is my personal favorite module. Okay, so what happened as a result of those um, imperfect videos? Uh, here's another tweet where I'm checking back in with Michelle about a month later and something interesting was happening. I was feeling more connected and my students were doing things they had never done before, like just dropping by the library where I work to say hello and to introduce themselves. 
um, and to tell me they recognize me from my videos. Uh, so I was really excited about that. And then if you go to the next slide, Michelle, the interesting thing, thing that continued to happen towards the end of the semester, um, as I was doing my regular like nudging of students to try and get them to submit work that they had missed to, to finish the class to succeed, in the past, when I had sent out those emails, um, I would like not get a response from students or they wouldn't submit the work and wouldn't even reply to me. But this time they were replying to my emails and they were submitting their work. And that was really exciting for me. So I checked back in with Michelle and I'm thinking, you know, at this point, they didn't want to disappoint me. They knew who I was. They knew I was a human. They knew that I cared about them and they were actually doing the work. Um, and if you go to the next slide, Michelle. So um, this was confirmed in the end of course, end of semester feedback survey that I do um, that's anonymous for my students. And I ask them, what did you like best about this class? And a lot of the comments, as you're seeing on this slide, were about the videos. Um, I really loved your short videos. I learned from it. Um, the content was great, but what stood out was the way you delivered the information, the short videos. Um, and just comments about the teacher or the videos. Okay, and then next slide, Michelle. All right, so um, at the very end of Michelle's post, I'll return to it here. The takeaway, she really summed up, you know, what I experienced on that journey in the fall semester, that rigor is derived through engagement. And when your students feel trusted, they can engage at a higher level. And when they know you care about them and believe in them, they'll work their asses off not to disappoint you. And that definitely rang true for me. And um, I would just encourage all of you to find the one thing that you can do next semester to connect with your students and to build that rapport and the relationships from the beginning so that when it gets to the point where you need to make demands of them, it's seen as an act of care from an actual human being um, who supports them. And with that, I will turn it over to Fabiola. Could I Thank ask you. Aloha a couple of questions in the chat? Because I think she can answer them super quickly. Okay, yeah. How did you get captions on your videos and where did you put the videos in Canvas? Okay, I, all of my videos I upload to YouTube. Um, so I record them on my phone, upload to YouTube. YouTube will apply automatic captions and then I just edit them it's really quick. If they're short, it's quick to do the videos. Um, and then I put them in Canvas. I either send them out with my weekly announcement that goes out every Monday, um, or I put them on the very first page of the module. Thanks. Okay, Bobby. Great, let's go to the next slide. Thank you. So what can we learn from Mr. Miyagi? the karate warm demander. I have two of my favorite quotes that he shares with us. He says to Daniel, we make a sacred pack. I promise to teach you karate. You promise to learn. And then Mr. Miyagi also says, no such thing as a bad teacher, only bad, I'm sorry, no such thing as a bad student, only bad teacher. And that's from Mr. Miyagi. Now, moving to the next slide. We can upend inequity by becoming a warm demander. Uh, to become a warm demander, you know, we want to become warm demanders because inequity by design will always find ways to target and undermine diverse students with cognitive um, uh, to, I'm sorry, <laughs> um, let me start that all over again. We have to become warm demanders because inequity by design will always find ways to target and undermine diverse students' cognitive abilities and cognitive stamina. We have to coach for competency in order to build confidence and enable independent thinkers. And that goes back to what Michelle was uh, describing to us regarding a dependent learner and an 
independent learner. And our goal is to coach them to become independent thinkers and learners. Next slide. Zaretta Hammond says, only through competence can we bring confidence to a level of consciousness where all students can feel like they can do it. For example, when Aloha sends her videos and says, you already know how to Google. And so she's giving them that, okay, you already know how to do this. And so then she coaches them to become a professional fact checker. Zaretta Hammond asks this very um, you know, powerful question. How are we making sure that all students, particularly the most vulnerable, historically marginalized students, get the most powerful teaching that helps grow their brain power and not just teaching to move through the content? And I'm gonna add to this to say that there's a responsibility we have when we practice growth mindset, which is the warm part. For every cheer we give our students, we have to be responsible by providing them the necessary moves, which is the demander, to achieve the touchdown. Cheering is not enough. I always use sports metaphors. Um, so let's look at how this you know, transpires and um, let's go to the next slide. So to be a warm demander like Mr. Miyagi, we become a coach, or in this case, a sensei, to cognitive development while we're covering our content so that students can handle failure, be shown how to improve, develop brain power, and reach levels of mastery. Only then can they develop a confidence to be an independent thinker. So let's look at this short edit that I brought in for those of us who've never seen the Karate Kid. Now show me wax on, wax off. Aye. Wax on, wax off. Wax on, wax off. Hey, wax on, hat. Wax off, hat. Concentrate. Look in my eye. Lock a hand. Thumb inside. Wax on, hat. Wax off, hat. Wax on, hat. Wax off, hat. Wax on. Wax off. Ush. Show me wax on, wax off. Hat! 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 Show me pen to fence. Hat! So um, as we see here, he's Mr. Miyagi is building competence before confidence. And there's that trust that we were talking about. Mr. Miyagi, he is dedicated to Daniel's success. So he's able to be demanding, but Daniel respects him and trusts that he, that Mr. Miyagi has his best interest. Mr. Miyagi was actually developing muscle movement so that when it came time to actually do karate, Daniel was already starting to build confidence. I'm sorry, he was starting to build competence before developing confidence. Daniel's confidence grew when he realized Mr. Miyagi was focusing on his success and development. Next slide. So I am proposing an online dojo. And I worked with my colleague who is a karate, uh, a karate practitioner, and he shared with me all this information about a dojo. So I provided here what he provided me, is that a dojo is a place of immersive learning and meditation, usually for martial arts. Uh, students learn a level of mastery to move to the next level, okay? The sensei, this is powerful, the sensei is the instructor. He teaches or the sensei teaches, 
protects, encourages, and expects excellency. But the sensei has a lot of responsibility on him to be able to have a student succeed. Um, dojo in Japanese means the place of the way in Japanese. Um, but yet the ultimate goal is to create more enlightened human beings. The lesson is not just karate only. The lesson is for your whole life. Your whole life must have balance. Then everything can be better. Mr. Miyagi. Now substitute karate and put your discipline. The lesson is not just economics only. The lesson is for your whole life. So I have here four bullet points. Zaretta Hammond says, only the learner learns, okay, by actively thinking about and talking about both the content and their learning moves. Competence precedes confidence. I have another Miyagi quote. First learn to stand, then learn to fly. Like a sensei, we can help students improve their learning moves and increase their cognitive stamina. Work towards mastery through deliberate practice for learning. Next slide. So here are two points. What, what I mean by deliberate practice for learning. Practice builds learning, okay? It's that wax on, wax off. Um, learners learn, and our job is to build learning muscles, okay? We have to adjust our course design and feedback and delivery to fit in a practice, to fit in, you know, this ability to practice our learning. And so we have to do that for our students. How can students practice their learning? The next is adopt an actionable feedback. Give students, uh, guide students to develop their new learning moves. And I love this quote, because either you do karate yes, or do karate no, you do karate guess so, and you get squashed like a grape. So change karate to your discipline. Either you do sociology yes, or you do sociology, no. You do sociology, guess so. You get squashed like a grape. Next slide. So here's the slide that I like to always put that people can photograph or print out. And so it's like, how do we do this? Um, in order to be a warm demander, we, it starts through um, trust through care. Okay. And both Michelle and Aloha shared about the power of care. And Zaretta Hammond differentiates between caring about and caring for. And caring for is active engagement in doing. How do we do that? Um, it starts from the very beginning. Uh, one, again, Judith Kleinfeld, she shares this. And of course, we have to establish interpersonal relationships from the very beginning. And here are some references that you can work on, that you can look at what a liquid syllabus is, pre-course contact, week one, personal contact. And then we have to acknowledge that our content is new information. Okay, the minute learning gets hard, there's confusion. Okay, and that's the part where students are gonna go, I don't wanna do this. That we do that as humans. So teachers can coach students to become okay with confusion and coach a student to get to the next level. Again, that is our job. Um, last but not least, be the content specialist sensei. You're the content specialist, okay? So we know this content. So how do we increase their brain power? How do we coach them? And obviously, how do we know our limitations, okay? So we have to look at how we're teaching and look at where we're struggling. And if we can't figure out, then ask for help through research or through your colleagues, okay? A sensei always knows their limitations. So if you are struggling with something, ask for help, which leads to my next slide. Our next slide. 
So here we have our Google Doc that everyone can share, that everyone can have access to. Which I forgot to introduce earlier. <laughs> Go for it, Michelle. Yeah, so we do have this doc, as some of you found, I can see, which is wonderful. Um, and to get to it, if you go to our resource site, which, which we put in the chat, um, and we will do it again in just a moment. Let me, let me do it right now. And for those of you viewing the live stream, uh, the URL, the short URL is at the top of the, the page here. But if you go to the share page, you'll find a link to an editable Google Doc. And if you click open the Google Doc in a new window, if you're on a computer, uh, you can edit it directly. And we just want to invite you to add takeaways from today's session, add some ideas, some teaching strategies that you're already using that support warm demand or pedagogy. Um, there's so many of you out there and there are so many very successful approaches to teaching. Teaching is an art and the more we can share what each other is doing, the better. Isn't that a beautiful thing right there? Just watching all of those ideas just start to flow right on the screen. I absolutely love it. Um, so we'll let that go. Uh, Fabi and Aloha, are we good to transition over to some Q&A now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, we have some really powerful questions. Um, and let's see. Hold on a second. Let me get my focus. There was uh, one in particular that I wanted to start with. Uh, where was it? Um, okay, so Sandra is saying there have been studies that female instructors receive more attempts at manipulation by students because in society we're seen as nurturers. It's not necessarily a bad thing. They wouldn't ask male instructors what they'd ask females and they display different behaviors and attitudes. I know this could actually be a good thing, the communication part, but I wonder how this warm rigor affects the other things. Is, is that a dumb ponderance? So, there's that question, but there's been other questions too about kind of, um, you know, the biases against um, gendered ways of teaching. And of course that, I, in my view, goes back to higher education that is, that is very much based on white values that are often male values. And I think that's a really powerful and important thing to talk about. Um, we also had a question about how students in a class, um, white students in a class may feel being challenged and pushed by a black instructor. So those really fascinating, delicate, and so important nuances. Bobby, do you want to address, respond to that? Just some of your thoughts. It's open that conversation. Um, well, the instructor, in my opinion, as all of us, a clear teaching philosophy is extremely important in establishing that personality of who we are as instructors, whether we're male or female or of color. It's who we are. As a, as a Latina, uh, you know, that's very centered in my philosophy, in my teaching approach, and that I am different from my, let's say, Anglo professors. I'm very touchy online, because that's how I was raised, where my household is very loving, and so I let them know, I'm going to be on you. I'm going to, those of us who are, you know, my, my Latinx, you know, we have the chancla. I'm going to be there to make sure that you're, you know, doing uh, the work. And so I put forward my personality, but it's also important to create that dialogue between if the student is uncomfortable in any way. I was uncomfortable with male teachers too. So you have that conversation. I was uncomfortable with white men. So I've had to have, you know, my own conversation and also just making sure the teacher knew where I stood. That's if I had the confidence. Aloha, you wanna add anything? I agree, I think, I think Fabiola handled that, that very well. Yeah, we have some other questions about um, 
you know, how, how do you ensure that you're, you don't get taken advantage of? And how do you know that you're not being too nice? And I think that this is often the, the problem when we talk about this type of pedagogy is that it's, it's, it's about being human and establishing a connection, but it's not about making things easier. It's not about letting students walk all over you. It's the exact opposite of that, right? It's about maintaining a high standard of excellence and pushing back on students and letting them know they can do it along the way. Yeah, and, and I'll add, I didn't, when I did, you know, the experiment in the fall, I didn't change my policies um, as part of that. It was really just changing that uh, relationship that I had. And I think the key was making sure that was in place before I tried to then, you know, uphold those policies or get them to submit something that they had missed. Um, so yeah, it was fascinating. Yeah, yeah. I, I also, I'm sorry. No, you I also, I also think it's experience, okay? All of us go through every semester and we reflect what works, what doesn't work, um, but it really is experience. Um, I'm getting close to 20 years in teaching. I don't look like it, but um, <laughs> uh, I was teaching when I was a grad student, so. Um, you know, it is experience. It's knowing how to handle um, when you do start to feel like the content or the ex instruction is being taken for granted. And that's where you step in. So I don't have a, a, a clear answer to that, but all I'll say is experience will teach you. Just really reflect and ask questions um, and look at how you're presenting your information. Because right now, no one um, takes advantage. And it's at a point where I have students just apologizing to me whenever they do something wrong. And I have to be like, it's okay, it's normal. We all make mistakes. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm trying to focus on the Q&A. There's, so there's so many questions in here and um, I, I always feel cognitive overload talking about cognition, trying to focus on dialogue and conversation. And Michelle, um, can I just say one more thing yeah, on what, what Fabiola just said as you're looking for the next question. Um, I had in the slide notes um, some examples of students, what they had responded to me when I, you know, reached out to them to try and get them to do their work. And it was the same thing. People weren't really taking advantage of me. If anything, they were apologizing. Um, so my students would say, thank you for giving me an opportunity to catch up. I fell behind and it's completely my fault. I should have completed the assignments on time, but it's been a very busy month. I will complete them tonight. <laughs> like those are the types of responses that I was getting. Yeah. Absolutely. Great. Um, I'm getting a lot of notes in the Q&A about people not being able to type in the Google Docs because there's so many people trying to type, which I think is really fascinating. I want to loop back just because we only have a, three, a few minutes left here and there are still so many good questions, but uh, we haven't addressed a couple of questions about uh, videos. And so you, uh, Aloha, you mentioned that you record your videos using your phone. You, you strive to keep them short. You make them very live and unedited and imperfect and you're fine with that. Can you talk about how you get them on YouTube from yes. your phone? Yeah, so I find that the easiest way to do it is to have the YouTube app on your phone, which is just the same YouTube app that you would watch a YouTube video on. Um, if you have that app on your phone, then you can simply open the app, click upload, and it pulls right from your, your camera um, that you just recorded on. So that's how I prefer to do it, but there's a million ways. I mean, if, you are, if you're using like Apple products, you could just airdrop it from your phone to your computer, if that's easier, or you can upload on your mobile browser, but basically you wanna get it to like YouTube, a site to host it from your Excellent, phone. excellent. And two more things about video before we run out of time. It was just announced this week that CVC OEI is with funding from the chancellor's office is providing YouTube studio through the entire system of California community colleges. YouTube studio is a video recording and hosting tool that is not free, but it's now available in canvas for faculty who teach at a California community college system and it automatically captions. So that is certainly something to learn more about. Um, cvc.edu is the website for CVC OEI, and um, I imagine that you'll be seeing more communications about that soon. Fabiola, tell us what Clips is and why you love it. 
Oh my God. Well, first of all, it's in your phone. Um, it closed captions um, while you're speaking, editing captions in clips on your phone on the fly is really super easy. And the reason why it's called clips, because you can take a clip at a time and it stitches it together. So instead of talking a whole entire lecture and like, oh, I got to start all over, you can actually be like, hi class, welcome. Today is Friday. Unclick. So next week we have unit two. Unclick. And so you could really do all this delivery on the spot, on the fly, and then go back to the transcriptions and edit them right then and there. And then when you don't look this fabulous, you can make yourself a Memoji and um, still provide some, you know, warmth and uh, guidance to uh, your students. So we are at time. Thank you, Fabi. Thank you, Aloha. And to all of you out there, last call. We want you to take the challenge, just take the challenge, give it a try, implement these, these ideas into your courses in the fall and see what happens. You may not have all the answers in your head about how you're going to do this and how you're going to do that. Try it and then look back and, you know, figure out what you need to tweak from there. So thank you so much, Fabi and Aloha for sharing. And thank you everyone for being here. Have a great rest of your Juneteenth. Bye everybody. Bye.